Hey, welcome to another episode of Masses United. Today, I'm very excited to be uh, welcoming uh, Dimitri uh, to the stream. He's uh, Justice International's, I, I want to say, like, propagandist in chief. Uh, he's our, our theory expert. And whenever I get super depressed, which I am today as a result of the IPC announcement, um, he always ties things into theory and talks about how to th make things actionable and also tying it to the historical to say why why these things mattered and how we can make them matter again and how, why things maybe aren't so as depressing as they feel in the moment. Uh, so Dimitri, it looks as though the capitalist class is winning. They're trying to kill us all. Nothing's slowing them down. What are your thoughts on the IPC report and how can we kind of find some good in it? Yes, it's, it's kind of, right? Like I, I feel like for those of us who've been paying attention to climate and what's happening, it's not really like a surprise, the findings of the report. We kind of, like, even we saw, I think, like, a few weeks ago, there was a director from KPMG who replicated a study from MIT from the 70s. And the study basically said the way we're going, we're headed basically for civilizational collapse by 2040. And you're right, like, it's not like something extreme, like, okay, like, humanity is going to go extinct or whatever. They're just saying, you know, like, our global civilization is going to break down. Is that all? <laughs> just a small thing. Yeah, like, yeah. And I mean, like, you know, like at the time, it was like ridiculed, right? And people just didn't listen to it. And now, like, right, like Kim, Kim PMG is not like some bleeding heart leftist. Like, this is, you know, like a capitalist organization that has best of interest in capitalism working. And one of the directors, right, like, he, she went through and, like, you know, credit given where it's due, like, she was able to step back from, like, what she believes in. And, you know, just look at the facts and the facts told her, right, that basically what MIT found in the 70s was on point and we're headed for this, like, one of the worst scenarios. And now, right, like, we have IPCC, we have, I think, like, a few other, like, fairly mainstream organizations now basically sounding the alarms. And, and I think, like, the question is, what's gonna, like, what will be the outcome? Because... What we're really seeing is that now governments and organizations and people are kind of starting to acknowledge that, yes, climate change is happening. It's horrific. And it's going to be a lot worse than anybody expected happening a lot faster than anybody expected. But we don't really see any actual action at scale or right? like any systemic change. And we're clearly past the point where, you know, like turning your lights off, recycling, you know, changing your light bulbs is really going to make any difference, right? And like some of the solutions that we see being peddled, like, you know, oh, we need like electric cars. I mean, that's nonsense, right? Like the production of those electric cars to replace all the gas powered cars is just going to create more emissions during this decade than it could possibly avert. Uh, like our Canadian government, right? I think like Trudeau made some, some tweets about it. it's like, oh, you know, like we really need to deal with climate, and then you know, like he's, he's still buying the pipelines, he's still like doing the same things he was doing. Yeah, we still have Alberta, right? And Kenny and Biden, also, you know, like doing a whole bunch of oil projects and fossil projects while going like on Twitter and talking about how it's like, yeah, it's it's a big problem, yeah, it's like good. <laughs> Like for me, like I think for me, I I think I'm uh, the last week has really radicalized me. Everything from like Andrea Horvath to kind of not being super in favor at first about vaccinations, um, and then like the just watching the BC NDP and how they've kind of just been complete like just neoliberals on almost every front, and then even today they they launched an attack on people who were kind of blockading the uh, the cutting down of old growth forests and. These projects are led by the big banks, by the hedge funds, by the richest classes and it is it's the ndp propping them up and so i feel like i'm done with electoralism do you feel like like that is a uh consistent that we've seen historically that gives you some hope that maybe people will be finally driven to real action as a result of this or where do you hope people kind of focus their their frustration their agitation so i mean like unfortunately historically <laughs> people don't seem to care as long as they don't experience the problems personally yeah. And I said, like, it's rational, right? Like, if, like, if the system works for me personally, and, you know, if I'm happy or at least, you know, like, not too discontent, I have a tendency to think that things work, that the system works and, you know, like, our party is doing their job and elected politicians are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, you know, I go to election and I vote for whatever party seems to represent my views the closest. 
and it makes sense that if if everything's fine, people aren't too engaged politically because why would they be? Yeah. Um, so the fact that we're seeing more politically engaged people, I think, tells us that a lot of people are noticing things that are not really working for them. So historically, that's kind of like what's really leading people to start questioning if the system really works and maybe it needs updates. I think, right, like it's not so much that there's like any conspiracy or anything, but it's just people doing what, you know, what works in their interest and what ultimately, you know, what the environment and the laws and the system kind of like encourage them, what behaviors it encourages. And for our politicians, like if you look at our politicians, like in any party, they're predominantly well-off people, right? Like it's a very list, they're middle class, upper middle class, and, you know, otherwise they're just like billionaires themselves. And right, like this could be good people, but they, you know, they're related to their own problems. And they're very different from a person, you know, who, you know, who's on the street or a person who can't, you know, make ends meet or has like a terrible living situation or a bad job because they themselves don't experience those things. And it's hard for them to put themselves in the shoes of a person that does. And so we kind of can see that, like the system we have is self-perpetuating as long as the people in power, you know, don't really see a problem with the system. And it's kind of like, right, like, it's designed to prevent change, really, even the fact that we can vote, like, let's say NTP had amazing socialist policy somehow. I mean, it's not the case, we all know, but <laughs> let's say it did. Okay, they get the power, and, you know, what they need to do takes, like, 10 or 20 years to do. Yeah. Unless they can stay in power for those 10 to 20 years, and other parties can come in and just change everything. And so it kind of, like, necessarily limits the horizon of what the party can hope to achieve while during their term. Yeah. And you constantly hear, right? like, if you're playing custom musical chairs with our parties, you can't really take big actions. Like, we can't build a mass rail system like in China, where they said, you know, we want to connect all our cities and we're going to build this high speed rail. And within a decade, they have a crazy amount of high speed rail. Like, if you go on Google Maps, look in China, it's just like it's shocking how much rail there is. And like, you go 10 years ago, there was nothing. Yeah. But that takes kind of like this kind of central commitment and planning we just our system isn't designed to do and and i think like right like when we deal with this kind of politics like when like when things are fine and they need like minor adjustments then yeah our system probably works right if if something happens that's out of the blue and we need to fix it our system can adjust but when we need to take like very drastic action, when we need to solve problems of large scale, yeah. our system really fails at that. Yeah. I think yeah. I, I'm so excited by what you're saying because on the one hand, I'm hearing like building class awareness. And I let something that you're like really focusing with like your work and you write a lot of great articles and whatnot, getting people, average people to realize that you're not a capitalist and you're not really benefiting from the society. It, the efficiency in this system is not being designed for you. It's designed for those who own capital. But then it also sounds like you're pushing towards revolution. Like that's like, it sounds like you're working on like A with like the class awareness and then you're working on the Z with pushing for a revolution. Like where do you feel like it's, it's best for people to engage Age at the moment? Are we still just hammering away on A while being inspired by the revolution? Or where do you see uh, a direct action most necessary? Yeah, I feel like we're still kind of like in very early stages because yeah. our left is very much kind of infantile, I would say, and nascent. And what I mean by that, people are just starting to really care about these topics, right? Things like class awareness, inequality, capitalism, like what it all means. Like if you pluck a random person off the street, they probably couldn't even define what capitalism or socialism are. Yeah. So <laughs> in this like very, very early nascent stages of people like thinking about these problems. And I don't think it's really possible to have any kind of like revolution if majority of people doesn't even care or doesn't understand what they want. And I think that that's where we have this like really heated debates on the left where people have all these like different positions and they argue with each other. But I think the problem with that is often it kind of ends up being a bit of kind of cosplay, right? Because <laughs> sometimes people just don't know what they're talking about and they just, you know, they want to get like views, they want to get attention. And I think a lot of 
YouTube left is unfortunately that way. They're not really there to build like a movement. They're just there to promote their personality. And then they say just basically whatever gets, you know, viewership. And usually it ends up being sort of like Fox News. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just a bunch of nonsense, but it like fires people up, right? And gets an yeah. emotional response. And then they get the viewers and they start fighting amongst each other, right? Like you can get more viewers and they get like jealous about like people listening to other people. And I feel like that that's very counterproductive to me. Yeah. But I think what we really need to be focused on is like, what is the like lowest common denominator on the left? What are the things we can all agree on, right? Like, that's not works about, right? Like, people get upset about like anarchists or ten keys or whatever, right? Like, look, you're so far away from any of those ideologies taking root within like general society. Like, we all have to understand, like, we're, like we're very niche groups. We're talking about like maybe like thousands of people, and like amongst those thousands of people, it's just like groups of you know 10, 20 people who get like very upset about things, yeah. and. <laughs> Like, we, we, I think, like, we on the left have to, like, really get that perspective and understand just how niche we are. Yeah. Like, the idea of socialism, how niche it is in Canadian society. And, like, if you're going to be bickering about things that really don't matter, and that's what I mean by cosplay, right? Like, when people start arguing about those, like, finer points of socialist point policy or what socialism means, right? Or, like, what kind of, like, socialist country we want to have. Like, we're just not there yet. It's, it's pointless. Let's, let's focus on, like, how do we get more people to understand what socialism is? What are the problems with capitalism? Why we can't reform what we have? And, like, when we talk about revolution, right, it's kind of like people immediately jump to this idea of violence. Yeah. It's like, oh, revolutions are violent, right? There's going to be, like, uprooting, you know, we're going to, like, drag out landlords and, like, kill them on the street or something. But, you know, like, look historically, right? Like, in every revolution that happened, Nobody just like went out with pitchforks and like started killing people. People were demanding reforms. They were demanding social change. They were demanding you know, like better worker rights. And then when the ruling class, the people in charge, kept suppressing those things and resorting to violence, like police violence, and we see it right, like our like G twenty protests when like Toronto, you know, like cracked heads, uh, pipeline protests, uh, homeless people being evicted from parks. Like, all of that is violence by the state against the most vulnerable people in the state. And that's, right, like, that's where the violence starts. The violence isn't started by people who want a revolution. Like, nobody wants to go to mortal combat with, like, well-armed, well-trained, highly organized, right, like, state police and military. Like, nobody in their right, their right mind wants that. People just want to live their lives in peace. Yeah. But they become violent when they realize they have nothing to lose at that point, right? Like they realize their living conditions are hell, their working conditions are hell, and they don't see any path to their lives improving, right? They see like every year, every decade, their life just gets worse. And at some point, right, it gets so bad that there's just nothing else to do. Like, like a lot of revolutions were caused by things like famines, like the Russian revolution in 1917. The major driving thing behind the revolution was a famine. Mm. That literally meant people had no food to eat. They were starving. <laughs> like, you know, when you're starving, okay, you know, like, I'm going to starve to death anyways, I might as well fight back. That's that's what it takes. But we don't have to get to that, right? Like, we're at the point right now with climate change where we can still avoid the worst case scenarios. Like, we can still save billions of people across the world from dying in this horror, horror of climate change. But like for once, right, like we have to recognize that we can't just keep doing what we're doing. And yeah. like, I don't know what the solution is. I don't think like anybody really knows, you know, what's the one true way. I don't think there is one true way, but I think like the lowest common denominator is the one thing like anybody on the left has to accept is what we're doing now is not working. Yeah. And if you keep doing what we're doing, we're going to die. Or many of us are going to die. And right, and this, this means like we can't just keep doing elections, you know, asking, begging our politicians to do change. We, we know, like, we've tried this, like, decades and decades and many decades. And, I mean, like, the most recent example would be U.S., where people strongly advocate that, you know, like, okay, we get Democrats in power, it's going to be a stop gap, you know, it's going to improve things. Nothing really improved. Yeah. Like, yes, yes, there are some tokens things, right? And, like, some things probably didn't get worse than they would have. But if you step back and look, like, on a larger scale, it's 
it's the same thing. Like they're still driving the storage extensions. They're still propping up the system. They couldn't even pass like something like the Green New Deal, which doesn't even like abolish capitalism. It's not radical in any way. It's just yeah. saying, oh, how do we save capitalism? Yeah. Right? Like, how do we save the system? And they're just like, no, that, that's too far. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they so, couldn't even get their two grand through. Like Canada, we've had that. Uh, we had it past tense uh, with CERB. And that was like two grand a month for everybody who's in desperate need. Um, not everybody, but a lot of people. And the US, they can't even get that, even though it was clearly promised. It's just astounding. Yeah, it's it's just self-destructive at this point. Yeah. yeah. And and so like right, like if you accept that, okay, like we could like I'm not discouraging anybody from voting, but you know, like it obviously doesn't make it worse. But I think we have to make a distinction between voting and devoting your time to electorate. Mm-hmm. Right? Like if like you have to ask yourself, you know, are you really accomplishing any meaningful change that way? Like, yeah, yeah, go vote NDP, right? Like if you feel like it's gonna help. Uh, I mean, like, you know, probably go vote anyways. It, it just it's not that much effort, right? To do it. Yeah. And the other aspect of it is it doesn't really help if you don't vote, right? Because it's not like a bike it's not like some organized movement not to vote that has some demands or something because there are no demands yeah. it's just people kind of like not participate and it just makes it easier for psychopaths to do what they want to do anyways <laughs> yeah yeah so that, that's really all it enables yeah. and if we got enough people to say okay voting isn't working then we have other options then we have much better options at that point well, like, think- sorry yeah go ahead no, I was just going to say, like, um, like to that extent, like, what do you think, like, some of the historical, like, revolutionaries might be doing in this moment to build capacity? Do you feel like, like, Lenin would be out, like, in Toronto starting up, like, a paper? Like, is he already signed up with, like, the Communist Party? Like, do you see any, any, any similar trends? Like, I, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm so ignorant when it comes to, like, the theory kind of stuff. But, um, like, I, I, I wonder if a famine is what it took to kickstart the Russian Revolution, like I, I see there's um, like there's been like reports with like diminishing uh, water across like the Pacific, um, like Pacific Northwest. And we've had issues with like uh, fish stock as the heat has been so high. It's killed all the salmon in, in several rivers. And I think that we could like legitimately be seeing famines next year or the coming years ahead. Like, do you feel like we should be prepping for that? I know these are hard questions, not easy to answer, but I don't, I'm just wondering if you see any like parallels. Like, what would Lenin be doing right now? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, like, uh, I, I think, like, right, like, the interesting part is Bolsheviks focused a lot on education. Mm-hmm. They ran underground newspapers. They talked to unions. They got unions, right, to have, like, educated, politically educated people come in and, like, talk to the workers and do presentations for them and, like, get workers to actually start reading things. And I know, like, a lot of people today, right, say it's like, oh, you know, like, Reason is just too much work. People don't have time. Like, these people work like 12 to 15 hour days. Mm, like, they worked way harder than right, like we work today. And then they somehow found ways to get together illegally <laughs> and read capital to each other and debate it and discuss it. Oh. And I think, like, why it's valuable, or at least it's proven valuable in the past, is because doing like reading this hard theory, like this. Uh, stuff like Marxism, right? Like stuff like what Lenin wrote. And Lenin, I think, like was much more accessible than Marx, in my opinion. Mm. Like he was just like really to the point, you know, he explained <laughs> things like very plainly with lots of examples. I think that that's like, uh, that is really the way to go, right? Like everybody doesn't need to kind of like focus on this like complex theory. It's just like a lot of the stuff is pretty obvious, actually. Yeah. But like getting that core understanding that we do have classes, right? Like we have people who own capital and primarily leave all the capitals that they own, either in terms of right, like being landlords, owning property or owning factories or owning newspapers or whatever, right? Like any big business where they directly don't do the work to run the business. And then they hire people who work for wages. And what happens then, right, is people do all the work, the business collects the profit and then says, okay, I'm going to pay you this portion of the profit. And this is right, like this is what you get for your work. And like, right, like, if, you, if you're in a position where you get in a wage, you're working class. It doesn't matter if you're like well off working class, right? Like you're a software developer and you make like maybe I don't know, like 200K or something or a doctor. Like if you need to keep showing up to work every day, you know, <laughs> or you get fired and you're afraid of ending up on the street, 
when your savings run out, you're not a capitalist, right? You're not benefiting from a system of capital. Yeah. And right, like in this education, this like understanding of things like class distinctions, like where does classes come from? Why is there is class antagonism? Because right, like you have, if I own capital, my interest is to pay people as little as possible, give them as few benefits as possible so I can create more capital. Yeah. If I'm working for a wage, then my interest is to get a higher wage. And that creates an antagonism that's inherent in the system, right? Like they have different interests. <laughs> and once I understand that, then it's much easier to inoculate people from all the bullshit that our politicians sell us when they say, oh, we're going to fix this, right? We're going to do this, or we're going to do that. And understanding why they want, why they can't, why it's not in their interest to do so, creates uh, a movement that's right like the last more than one election cycle like our party is more than focus groups yeah. it's like a talent show right it's like we're doing like you know america's whatever like next right like <laughs> politician basically yeah, right like yeah you're right yeah so on stage <laughs> they do a song and dance and then people go like oh yeah i like the song the best uh, i'm yeah. pressing that button <laughs> but <laughs> but like it's it's really like who lies better who yeah. you know like who's more convincing who's like it has nothing to do with what they're actually going to do. Like when liberals got elected in 2015 on electoral reform. And they said, nah, we're not going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and people went and it's like, oh, oh, you promised. Oh, I am. <laughs> what are you going to do? What conservative? Okay, good luck. <laughs> right? Like it's, yeah. it's silly. But, but until people like start seeing them those terms and understanding why that's happening, it's very easy to manipulate them. And that's, I think, like, where, like, where this, like, education in theory needs to start. And, and then, like, right, that has to be combined with also preferably things like mutual aid and help, right, like, maybe, like, legal advice. And this is why uh, Bolsheviks, right, their idea was you have a vanguard party. And this party consists of people who devote their time professionally towards being revolutionaries, right, like, understanding all the subjects, spending their time reading things other people don't have time to read and right like thinking about strategy and tactics and how to act and if they have the buying from the masses the buying from the people if they can convince them that they're working in their interests and with them and they're part of the people right then people can support them and provide that grassroots support that you need to change things to do things right like dealing with climate change within a decade and I think right, like, that has to be the relationship. And I don't see how it can work any other way because like any ad hoc efforts aren't coordinated and they're very easy to break up because our government is coordinated. It's organized, it's central. And, and we need a, like anything that can counter the system needs to be as effective. Mm -hmm. And I know like a lot of people have a problem with things like authority, right, and centralism and but we have to ask, right, like, not what, what's going to be a perfect system, but what's going to be a better system than what we have now? What's going to allow us to survive climate change? What's going to allow our liberalization to flourish? Right? Like, as long as the system allows for improvement, allows us to make it better, mm -hmm. that, and if it addresses a problem the current system can't, then I'd rather have that system than some platonic ideal of socialism that nobody has any plan to accomplish. Because if we're just gonna like bicker with each other about that, we're not yeah. gonna get anywhere. And we're right out of time now. We, get, we try we try doing this things, right? Like kind of like this measured slow approach for how many years? Like how long yeah. has it left? Since like 1900s, right? Like we've, it's been over a century. Yeah, no, it's insane. Like, I think like one of the things I respect is like, so I, not to like out you, but I think it's fair to say you're like a Marxist Leninist. And like I'm and calm, so I'm pretty like anarchistic in a lot of ways. But when I look at like the reality of the situation, it's like we need strong unions. And I don't see within like the anarchist program, which doesn't exist, but even theoretically, like what what is done to radicalize the unions? Because I feel like they're one of the keys to letting us down right now. And I, I almost wonder if like the NDP kind of professionalizing a pipeline for those within the union and labor movement to move over to electoral politics and almost just be subservient to the, <laughs> the capitalist class from the outset is kind of really kind of corrupted the movement in Canada. And that's why we're kind of so behind the times in so many ways. 
Um, but when I, that's one of the things to me, at least that's exciting about communism and why I, I recently joined the communist party is I'm like looking at it and like, okay, I still might in my soul be an anarchist, but I look at the, the, the gravity of the situation we face and I don't see a realistic solution with a short time we have that doesn't have within his program, a specific addressment of unions and like a, a systemic way to deal with labor and awaken the classes to the, awaken the class to the, the war we're in and they're struggling to survive. Um, I don't know, like, do you have a message to other people who are kind of a little bit like, I don't know, icked out by the, the communist thing? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I think, right, like, personally, like, I love the idea of anarchism. Like, as a social system, it's fantastic, right? Like, leave people alone, let them do what they want to do, and as long as you're not harming others, you know, you should have, like, complete freedom. It's a system I want to live in. So it's not like... <laughs> right, like I want to have like some sort of starring government, like telling people what you know what they can think, what they can do, and so on. No, but at the same time, like you said, right, it's just I also want actionable change, and unfortunately, I just don't see how it can happen with anarchism because we need some sort of coordination, we need some sort of central planning to accomplish those things. So I feel that if we can build a system that can kind of very like allow people to have a lot of grassroots power where people in authority can be held to account, then we can eventually try to diminish that authority and try to be more anarchistic. But also I think the reality is people who live today grew up in a capitalist system, in those, which is an authoritarian system. And that necessarily influences like the way we think because that's what we live through. That's what we understand. And it doesn't say we can just flip a switch and turn this into a different kind of system because people are going to keep acting right like the way they're used to acting. So you kind of you need something to hold people to account and to prevent those bad habits from taking over. <laughs> Otherwise, right? Like if you like if you somehow magically overthrow capitalism, where it's a completely flat system. What's going to stop capitalists from just getting back together and doing what they're doing now? Yeah. Like, we might end up with some libertarianism, right? Where you just have like yeah. five dollars of rich people doing what they want yeah. instead. Could be even worse, right? Yeah. Now they've got little communes out in Alberta. Yeah. No, I, I see it. <laughs> I, I feel like um, there's like so much I still want to dive into. I know we talked about doing like a two parter. So I'm going to like be like a little like spontaneous and say, like, what do you think of the idea of even just doing um, like a uh, like a book club, like just starting like now, like every every two weeks, uh, we'll pick a day like maybe it'll be like Thursday or something. And we can kind of go through like Lenin because I know like we did it with like J.I. for a bit. Uh, but I wonder if like you see value in that and trying to kind of get the message out there because Maybe that's a method for us. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good idea. And uh, like what we can specifically do is just kind of like look through Lenin, like at least a few of his works and see like how they're relevant to our time, like what changed, what kind of like stayed the same. Because I think like the other interesting part of this, right? Like those works weren't really meant to be <laughs> kind of like educational materials for future generations. Hmm. He was writing it for educating people in his time in their own conditions. And I think a lot of time, like even people who read Lenin and who are like communists don't actually realize that it's on the left. Yeah. Right? Well, that's so a good point. Like, and like, that was my other question is like, who do you think now is that voice? Like, do we have that voice? Have they already been neutralized by the state? Like, where are they and why aren't they more known? You know what? Like, yeah, I don't, I don't know who that would be right now. Yeah. I don't think like we really have a figure like that in the past that's, yeah. And like, but I think like those figures arise quickly because let's look at Latin America, mm -hmm. like yeah. all the left movements. And I think like, right, like for people who kind of like get eked out by communism and Bolshevism and, you know, have like negative views of Soviet Union, um, let's look at Latin America. Mm. Like yeah. ultimately they're similar tactics. They're very same idea. It's, you know, mass movement that has strong power with labor that has grassroots power, that basically organized strikes and protests and demonstrations. And to their credit, they managed to do it without any real violence or like with mm -hmm. minimal violence, even with a state actively trying to repress them. So I think that, that like if you, you know, if you only have a positive note here, like we can see this as possible. You should study this very recent like ongoing movements 
Oh, that's such a good point. Because yeah, like I think that the global like that uh, south there is the only thing that gives me hope in the current moment. Is you see those uprisings of people and they've done so well and they've like resisted the Lima Group and all like the various other like tentacles of capital and it is so inspiring. And like at the end of the day, like we're two white guys talking about it, but then you see there's like these are indigenous led movements and they've done so much. Um, and I think it's so exciting personally. So that's a really good note I think to end it on. <laughs> um, I don't know. Is there anything else that you wanted to kind of get out there? I think we definitely. Definitely we'll do a part two as a general conversation. And then if you're still down with it, um, like this is a, this this whole show is about like let's make things actionable. Like, yeah, maybe we'll hopefully next episode we can announce a specific reading group and uh start getting into that like Bolshevik stuff and trying to have more structure to this this action we're trying to get. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that sounds uh good. like a good plan. And like <laughs> I guess we'll see like uh, uh how people like it. I think like, yeah, like we can also maybe like take some feedback from the audience and see like what people actually want to focus on what what's interesting like what people are having trouble with mm -hmm. and like how maybe like different areas where theory is applicable why it's important and that, that could be really interesting like another thing i think that's worth mentioning too is like in relation to latin american movements is like right like i find like a lot of people on the western left spend so much time criticizing other countries for doing socialism abroad yeah <laughs> and, and you know what like I feel like we should just let them do their thing. Like, you know, like, I don't know, like maybe China's doing trade, right, maybe they're doing wrong, but they're doing something different, right? There's 1.4 billion people. They seem to like their government. Okay. Their government seems to be improving their lives. Let them do their thing. Maybe they're doing some things we can learn from. Like maybe they're doing some things we don't like and they're never going to be acceptable to us. Let's look at the, right? Like this country is in a through a lens of, you know, how does this apply to us? And what can we learn from them, positive or negative, and apply at home instead of just going, it's like, you're doing this wrong, <laughs> right? Like yeah. Cuba, Venezuela, China, Vietnam, you know, they're, they're doing something and they're like, they're doing more than we are. So let's yeah. figure out how they're doing at least as well as they are doing. That's and then we can start great. criticizing them for it when you can show them you can do better. <laughs> Yeah, that was like one of the things that like helped me a lot too is like, I think we had a conversation a while ago and you just said like to, to remember that like a lot of the time people raised in capitalism, they're, they're like you said, cosplaying as socialists, like they've never experienced socialism. So your idea of what socialism looks like is coming from a capitalist perspective. You're just being like a rebellious capitalist when you're judging these countries. You are truly from like the, the line of sight of the people on the ground and how it's revolutionized their living situation. And so for me, that's always helped is whenever I have a criticism, I'm like, I'm just like a white capitalist. Like, what is my right to say this? I'm just cosplaying. So I, I really appreciate that perspective for sure. <laughs> yeah, you summed it up like really well. That's yeah. <laughs> that's well, a great way to <laughs> um, any, any final thoughts to keep people surviving, keep people happy in the, the coming days ahead? I'm sure there's gonna be new more news that comes out shortly here. Um, yeah, I think. No, I think just you know try to stay positive. I think like right like you all have to, because if you if you give into depression, <laughs> <laughs> nothing's good go is going to happen yeah so we still have a chance and i think like what we really need to do is just like start thinking for ourselves like how do we change things how do we convince our friends to change things like like right like little things we can do is just like talk to our friends try to right like if you're ready to like agree with what we're saying here try to convince at least one more person and try to yeah. get them to convince another person we need to change like guys in canada <laughs> to be favorable to some form of socialism. And really, like, let's all try to support each other. Don't, right? Like, when, when you see somebody doing socialism wrong, not the way you want to do it, try to find some common ground instead of attacking them. Try yeah. to figure out, like, what can we work on together to change our current system? And then once we do, maybe we can start disagreeing. <laughs> and, and don't try, like, don't see disagreement as a bad thing. It's fine to disagree. It's fine to have a diversity of ideas, and it's good. We need to be able to self-criticize. But do it in a constructive way where, you know, you both learn something. Don't yeah. do it to attack, to prop your own ego, right, to get yourself followers. Criticize and learn to learn in order to learn and to teach and be ready to learn from others. Yeah, I think calling people out is such a capitalist thing. And we like, as like a society need to get better at calling people in and saying from like a place of love, like, hey, where are you coming from? And help me understand. And maybe they can educate you and they're actually coming from the right place or maybe they're not. And then with like love and you've already shown that compassion and calling them in, um, you have that opportunity to educate each other and go to a better understanding. So 
Yeah. <laughs> well, like, we're on the left, we're saying we're collectivists. Yeah. Well, let's try to learn to work collectively. Yeah. If he if he can't do that, then we're a farce. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dimitri, I think we're gonna have to cut it here, but thank you so much for your time, sir. Um, I really Thanks appreciate it. And then uh yeah, we'll 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 see you again next week if you you'd be so kind to share the time with us. And uh yeah, well, let's try to make things actionable. And um, I think like when you talk about like converting your friends. I think one thing that's always helpful too is memes. And this is just like a random plug for Canada left. Like we randomly make memes and a bunch of stuff like that. And I know um, Dimitri's on there sharing really good content and articles, and it's a good way to kind of be educated about some of the stuff that's going on and hopefully just share with a friend or two um, and try to kind of slowly increase people's leftist content uh, into their diet until they're all leftist too. So it could be fun. <laughs> Either way, we'll see you next week and we'll get some more concrete action. Uh, I'm really excited for it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, have a fantastic day. Right on. Thanks for having me. Okay, cool. Peace.